Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Would the clerk please take the attendance? Representatives Miller? Here. Pice? Stone? Here. Young? Here. Kofia? Here. Devendorf? Here. Fitzgerald? Here. Ryan Gittins? Here. Nyer? Here. Vanderwall? Present. Roth? Here. Beerline? Smith? Present. Madam Chair, you have a quorum. Rep Kofia moves to adopt the May 17th minutes presenters we have quite a few folks wishing to speak to this bill today so i'd ask that you please keep your testimony to five minutes and to ensure that we are able to take questions in a timely manner members committee members please keep your questions i'm asking you to keep your questions limited to one per presenter to ensure that we finish um, this committee on time again we will now go at ease, and Rep. Kofia will take the gavel, and I will move to speak on this bill. The committee will now come to order. Chair Miller, um, you have the floor. Please go ahead and introduce your bill. Thank you everyone for taking the time and attention as I speak on House Bill 4673, the right to repair for agricultural equipment. When I learned that I was being made chair of the chair of ag, my staff and I reached out to Farm Bureau and I wanted to get with farmers and their families to ask them what their concerns were. I thought it was important. So we sat down at a dinner that Farm Bureau helped organize and I so appreciated that. And we had a meal in a barn on a cold winter's Saturday evening that was beautifully decorated and we had a real conversation and this is what was talked about they shared their worries around the topic of right to repair explaining how this impacts their lives I heard it at the door a little bit but I got a better understanding when I had these one-on-one -on -one conversations so I hit the ground running we began working on this bill in early February knowing I needed to address this for my constituents I reviewed model policy and collaborated with stakeholders, including the Michigan Attorney General's Office and the Michigan Department of Ag and Rural Development, Agriculture and Rural Debe Development. Both are here today in support. When manufacturers are, are forced, and let me start again. When manufacturers force farmers to rely on their original manufacturer or their authorized repair providers, to fix their products, it undermines the farmer's right to choose and how much they pay for that. Farmers deserve to be able to repair their equipment, plain and simple. They need to do this promptly because time is so crucial for farmers. I learned that. We need to support the agriculture industry, and that's what this bill does. This is a common sense bill to help people avoid unnecessary delays that are that are so critical to their livelihood. It's a, if a crop is ready to harvest, farmers can't wait days to fix their equipment. They need it now, and they can't afford to wait. When it's broken down, they just sit there, and that's just not acceptable. It can ruin an entire season just like that. House Bill 4673 requires manufacturers to allow independent repair shops or owners access to parts, tools, or documentation that they need to repair their, their equipment for a fair and reasonable price. I want to stress that this bill is not punishment in any shape or form. It was never looked at that um, in that regard. 
It simply expands options for our farmers, options that they need, letting them, them choose where and who repairs their equipment. Manufacturers are, will still be allowed to charge and establish specific, specific terms in exchange for allowing independent repairers and owners access. My office is currently working with stakeholders, including John Deere and the North American Equipment Dealers Association to, to address valid concerns with this bill as written. And it's my hope that we can get to a point of agreement, and I feel very confident that that will happen because, again, the point is not punishment for our manufacturers. But we also need to make some changes here. Times have changed. And that bill addresses this again. This bill was written to ensure that safety, security, mission standards are not compromised by allowing independent repair at no point are manufacturers required to divulge trade secrets. And before I ask Jacob Feist I want to, uh, to join me today, I want to stress that this is common sense legislation that goes be beyond the political divide. So if Jacob could please join me. Is he here today? Please take the mic. The floor is yours. Um, first, I'd like to thank everyone here for um, giving us the time, uh, for bringing this very important issue um, to light, and thank you, Truman, for, uh, for giving us this time. Um, so first of all, my name is Jacob Feist. I farm um, with my father and my uncle in Jackson, Ingham Counties. We're a relatively small family farm in the grand scheme of things nowadays. And uh, the right to repair is obviously a, a very big issue for us on our farm and all our neighbor farms. Um, we learned to have the opportunity to come up here and have this opportunity um, reached out and talk to many um, of our neighbors and other individuals around. And it was definitely something that it's an issue my people don't realize is an issue. So, um, but yeah, so we definitely, I definitely support the, we need the right to repair, um, but we also need to be careful and too of, to make sure that we, you know, have a strong network of support from our manufacturers as well. Um, the biggest issues that we see on our farm is just, um, is the timeliness. Like you said, um, our crop, when, we have, when we're forced to wait to get our crop out because the machine is having a malfunction of something that doesn't stop it, it just, it's a code that you know, pops up and we can't continue our operation, it can shut down, you know, you can shut down the farm for days while we wait for a response to get that done. Um, but also I will say that our dealer network is an integral part in our farming operation. Um, we have to have a strong dealer network. We want to work with our dealer. I think we just need the ability to be able to quickly fix and diagnose our equipment when the issue arises. Um, the, our farm, you know, we use John Deere and uh, John Deere is an integral part in our farming operation. Um, without the John Deere company, I don't know, like they, everything we use is through their, is through their software, their equipment, and it's a very important um, piece of the operation. So yeah, I definitely support the right to repair, but um, not so much the right to modify. I believe that uh, the equipment as provided from the companies is adequate to meet our operating needs. I don't think we need to uh, modify the equipment as much. I just think we need the ability to diagnose, repair, and um, keep our equipment moving through harvest and get the crops harvested, animals fed, things of that nature to keep our operations going. Because as you all know, we're having less and less time all the time, you know, to get our, to get the crops in and out, animals fed, and um, we need to make sure that we can address issues with our equipment as they come up. Well, thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions before I start calling on speakers? Um, thank you both uh, for your testimony. Um, and so, members, just a quick reminder, as the chair asked, um, we're asking each uh, of our members to engage in one question each, uh, try to keep it to about a minute, just because we do have so many uh, folks here today who would like to testify. So with that, are there members, it looks like we have Representative Stone with our first question. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you for your testimony, Jacob. Um, not having a lot of farms in my district, it's helpful to have firsthand knowledge. 
Can you tell a little bit more about some examples of um, what equipment breaks down, how, what the timeline is for getting a repair secured, and dig into that a little bit more? On our farm, an example would be this, I mean, just this spring we were planting our corn and the tractor had a fault in the emissions, um, uh, you know, equipment. And literally it just, the tractor stopped, you know, we couldn't continue, we couldn't move. So we, and we went in, you know, um, got the code. You can get the code yourself. You can look in your manual to see what it is, but it just says call your dealer. So we called the dealer um, and we waited. Um, unfortunately, uh, and yeah, we, we didn't, we missed two days of planning. Um, it's been thankfully, I mean, one time I'm ever thankful it's dry, um, was then because we couldn't keep moving. I mean, and the weather provided, we had a window that we could keep going, but other years, you know, we're trying to get things in by the hour. So it would have, other years, it would have been a very, very catastrophic issue, but yet waiting and a lot of that is down to, you know, just consolidation of dealerships and things. We're having less and less options all the time, but, um, but no, the dealerships do the best they can. I just think there's, it's just, they're doing the best they can. It's like any industry, you know, it's just trying to find help and other, other issues. Um, but no, we, yeah, it, and there's lots of issues like that. That's just one. Representative Smith. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for being here and giving testimony. Um, so I uh, am a farmer myself, as you all know, and our, our family is, and um, this is something that I did here on the doors as well, um, representing one of the most rural um, agriculture districts in the state here. Um, so I'm sympathetic to some of the things in this bill, but I, I have some quite a bit of concern with other parts of that. Um, and the biggest thing is the way I read it on, on um, page three, that a judge could ultimately be needed to determine if the costs of the parts were quoted are fair or not. Um, so that presents quite a challenge here. I mean, if, if my car breaks down and I take it to a mechanic to get fixed, whether, I mean, or you know, a dealer or a non-dealer mechanic to fix that, I don't like the cost of his, his parts and what he's charging me. I can't simply take him to court over that. I mean, the answer and solution would be to find a, a different mechanic. Um, so why do we need a judge to decide the fairness on machinery parts here with this and not let the market sort this out? Um, that's one of the concerns here that I see in this bill. And um, as a farmer ourselves, I, I feel pretty confident and understand that I know um, better than any judge of what fair parts would be on, on um ag equipment and such. So I guess what are your thoughts with that, that portion of this bill? Thank you for that question. Every case is different. Every situation is different. Mm -hmm. So if they're going to court over an extreme price um, that they feel is out of the norm, that situation will be addressed by the judge with supporting documentation, I'm sure, from the plaintiff. So again, it's a case-by-case -case basis. Not, not two cases will be the same. Okay, thank you. Representative Nyer. Representative Fitzgerald. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, one question that I have is with the advancement in really the technological equipment, uh, you know, we have computers, we have a lot of, a lot of uh, technologically driven equipment now that we have to diagnose. The question is, in, in the cases that we're having trouble finding what we need to fix, is it more the technology issue and, and the, the computers on these, on these uh, uh, pieces of equipment are really what's the barrier to, to actually completing the repair, whether it be a gasket or, or um, some other type of actual physical repair of a part, or is it the technology itself failing and we need an opportunity to ha have coding done or, or malware, what have you? Sure. So years ago, farmers were able to fix their equipment. But as technology advanced, so did the way these um, pieces of equipment advance. So now it is a computer. And they can't have access even to the most simplest thing that can be repaired effortlessly. They have to go to the dealer. And that's the issue. Because 
Time is, again, crucial for farmers. They could lose their crops. So technology has advanced, and they made it to where they cannot get anywhere without going to a dealer or the manufacturer. And that's the issue. Thank you. Can I? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. so a little on that point as well. There are a few independent repair um, people out in the countryside that are helping us with certain issues, but their ability to repair equipment ends when it gets to the newer equipment. It's the newest equipment that we're, you know, we have the issue with. It's like, you know, older stuff, when things are mechanically driven, they're not, you know, everything's not electronic, everything doesn't have a, you know, control, you know, like our combine sprayer, you have to plug in to diagnose it, like a vehicle. But with a vehicle, you can take your vehicle to any auto zone or any other place, and they plug in, right? They have the equipment to do it. It's for what we see, it, I mean, it might be out there, but I've certainly never seen someone that has the ability to come out and scan my tractor um, other than the dealer. Thank you. I, I do have uh, my own follow-up question. I think this is for Mr. Is it Feist? Yes. Uh, so you, you referenced it briefly, but could you go a little bit more into what you're seeing as a farmer on the issue of consolidation? You made a brief reference to it. Can you go into a little more detail about what you're talking about there for those of us who are not farmers? Yep. So what we've seen, like in any industry, and agriculture is no exception, is that the consolidation of our suppliers is massive. Um, when I mean, like our farm, we use John Deere as the manufacturer that we use, but it's the same for all of them, I assume. Um, <clears throat> There used to be three, four different options in our local area over the last number of years since I've been on the farm. I got out of college 2010, so I've been full-time farming with my family since then. And um, at that time, we had four, ind four dealerships independent in our area pr providing sales and service, and now we have one. Um, the current, the current you know, company owns, like what in Michigan, there's probably three, four maybe. Um, John Deere dealerships, you know, not in, like there's a massive number of stores, but there's no competition as far as, you know, the farmer's ability to kind of like shop around or do things that way. Um, you're, you're pretty much stuck with what you have as far as that way in the countryside. So when you're waiting for service, we used to have a, a John Deere store five miles from the farm. That got closed. The dealership north of us, now we have to go into Mason um, for the dealership there. And the talks are that's even going to close. So then it'd be Williamston or Portland for me, which would be a, you know, 45 minute to an hour drive when I used to have it five minutes away. Um, it's just the consolidation and the closing of stores, and I don't see them have been adding any, you know, more tax or anything else, too. So as they move on, it's just the queue gets bigger and bigger when you're looking for support, um, you know, from the tech, tech, from the tech side. Um. Thank you. All right, seeing no further questions uh, for our current testifiers, the committee will go at ease. We will come to order. We will hear from testimony from M. Dart, Kathy Anger, and also T Director Tim Boring. Please come up. We appreciate you speaking today on this issue. Thank you, Chairwoman Miller members of the House Ag Committee. Uh, my name is Tim Boring. I'm Director of the Department of Agriculture and Rural Development. Thank you for the opportunity to lend our support for House Bill 
4673, which provides Michigan farmers the right to diagnose and repair their agricultural equipment. At its core, codifying right to repair benefits our producers and independent repair technicians to benefit the rural economy of our state. This bill ensures farmers and repair technicians have access to the information, software, and tools to repair modern farm machinery that relies upon computer systems. With this measure, farmers and independent techs can buy repair manuals and diagnostic tools already in use by dealership repair technicians. Modern tractors and harvesters are complex, sophisticated machines operated by numerous computer systems. Oftentimes when these systems fail, it's because of a simple sensor malfunction. This bill provides a path for farmers to troubleshoot and repair these systems on their own. It also provides the tools to independent repair technicians to work on computer-based farm machinery. These repair shops have been restricted in their ability to work on the controlling systems of tractors and harvesters for upwards of 30 years. This measure ensures competition in the marketplace and unshackles repair shops to have legitimate access to repair and diagnostic tools. This legislation does not prevent producers from taking their equipment to the dealership for repairs and services. Those dealership repair shops, which are independent businesses themselves, separate from the manufacturers, will continue to be important resources for farmers. This simply gives the opportunity for more options and timelier repairs when days matter. The provisions in this bill are alignment with the uh, uh, MOUs in place with manufacturers, uh, but those memorandums of understandings are, are clear that due to changed circumstances, those agreements may no longer be viable. This, uh, and that party shall provide simply written notice to the other of intent to withdraw from some of these existing agreements. That agreement's written in pencil. This measure here today uh, puts these sorts of things in ink for farmers. And I think certainly we can all agree that the farmers deserve to have the opportunity to be able to access repair and software diagnostic tools for their operations. So with that, thank you. Be happy to address any questions. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thanks for your testimony today. Question for you. So the automotive, you know, people who used to do the work at home in their driveway, um, as we've added more technology, even if we gave them the access to manuals, might not be adequately prepared to make those repairs on their own. Certainly. How pragmatic is it uh, that um, farmers can then take these tools and apply them? I think it's important to understand, too, the range of, of uh, breakdowns that farmers can encounter with tractors, right? And we're talking anything from catastrophic transmission failure, which is going to necessitate a, a full-on repair shop that are commonly found at dealerships today. But we also, with these computer systems today, have tractors that shut down for things like man malfun malfunctioning sensors, sensors that might cost a few dollars and agree are readily available at dealers. The trouble becomes oftentimes is the fact that replacing these simple sensors like this still requires a technician to come out with the computers to reset the codes in the tractors to get the thing running again. So uh, there's an entire range here of, of malfunctions and issues that we can encounter. Some of these are going to require extensive repair shop operations. Some of these more moderate things are going to be ideally suited to independent repair shops that can troubleshoot things and, and fix them on a, on a dirt floor in a farmer's barn. Some of these things are incredibly simple pieces of just swapping out cheap inexpensive pieces, but making sure the farmers have the ability to reactivate the codes and get the tractor running again. So again, this is a measure that institutes uh, competition within the marketplace that ensures that we've got a robust system here of addressing these repair needs for farmers and, and the wide variety of extents, uh, ex examples that they encounter on a daily basis. Any Thank you for your testimony. Thank you very much. Next, we're going to hear from Christy McGillaray. Would you please come up? Good morning. Just leave this on. Thank you. Um, so uh, thanks for inviting me here to speak today. I uh, really appreciate the opportunity. Um, on behalf of our 150,000 Sierra Club members and supporters in Michigan, um, we support uh, House Bill 4673, the Right to Repair Bill, that's under consideration from this committee. Um, in speaking with partners around the state, 
about our support for this legislation, the first question that we've gotten is, is this really your lane? Does Sierra Club have an opinion about farm equipment? And so based on this reaction, my assumption is that you guys might be thinking the same thing. So I'm really grateful for this opportunity to share uh, the reasons why Sierra Club does indeed have an opinion about whether or not farmers and other independent repair providers can repair their own farm equipment without having to rely on the original manufacturer. We care about the financial viability of farming as a sector, and this bill will definitely help farmers in Michigan save both time and thousands of dollars in repair costs. However, the alignment of this bill with Sierra Club's policy priorities is one of economic structure and waste. Right to repair is a part of a legislative movement that includes the right to repair farm equipment, but it extends to other sectors as well. Since the 1920s, when light bulb manufacturers teamed up to purposefully limit the lifespans of their products, companies have been locked into a linear business model rooted in the concept of planned obsolescence. Under this model, to grow, we have to sell more stuff every year. Around 100 years of operating under this ecologically destructive economic system, we are facing catastrophic climate change, a plastics crisis, ever cheaper products made from low quality toxic materials, and a race to the bottom for wages and working conditions across the globe. Planned obsolescence has a huge carbon footprint. It's why we see software mysteriously slow down. Furniture designed with hollow legs and cheap staples and clothing literally burns because it can't sell fast enough. As repair shops close, landfills expand, leaving a toxic legacy as they contaminate groundwater and soil and release methane into our rapidly warming atmosphere. Access to parts, manuals, and diagnostic software will keep equipment in use by incentivizing repair over replacement. We must prioritize repair over replacement to address the ecologically illiterate impulse for industries to externalize and not account for the actual cost of their profit maximization. We must design and build for durability, longevity, and repair, and right to repair bills encourage manufacturers to make good products that last. One of the best effects of these kinds of policies are dramatic cuts in greenhouse gas emissions from the manufacturing and waste sectors. This is a step towards acknowledging that our economy exists within our ecosystem, which has limits, not outside of it. We commend the bill sponsors for taking up this important legislation. Thank you for Thank that. Thank you. Is there any questions? Hearing no questions, we will move on. Thank you again. Appreciate it. Next, we have Mr. Bob Thompson with Michigan Farmers Union. Please come up and thank you for speaking today. Well, good morning, everyone. It's uh, a pleasure to be here. Uh, I have some prepared remarks here. Uh, Chair Miller, uh, Majority Vice Chair Pies, uh, Minority Vice Chair Nyer, and members of the committee. On behalf of the Michigan Farmers Union and the family farmers we represent in the state of Michigan, thank you for holding a hearing on HB 4673, the Agriculture Equipment Repair Act. To get acquainted, my name again is Bob Thompson, president of the Michigan Farmers Union, which is a grassroots organization that represents farmers and their communities in the state of Michigan. I've been a member of that organization since 1980 and uh, president since 2012. I was born and raised on my family's fifth generation dairy farm in the Wademan area north of Mount Pleasant. In addition to farming with my family, I did work for 33 years at the USDA's Farm Service Agency as a county executive director serving the farmers of Isabella County, Michigan. In that position, my staff and I were responsible for implementing all manner of production agriculture farm bill programs. With my wife, Shirley, we have three grown children and five grandchildren, and we continue to reside on and operate the family farm raising cash crops and a cow-calf uh, beef operation. As a farmer, I want true repair choice for my farm equipment. I want the right to repair. Farmers are heavily reliant on equipment such as our tractors, balers, sprayers, and combines to do our jobs and sustainably produce food, fuel, feed, and fiber for our communities and, of course, the nation. The modernization of the farm equipment has benefited everyone, but has also caused major repair headaches and reduced our repair choices 
because of restrictions that have been imposed by major equipment manufacturers. But it doesn't have to be this way. That's why I am here to speak in favor of Chair Miller's HB 4673, the Agricultural Equipment Repair Act. Major farm equipment manufacturers restrict repairs by requiring software tools to make some repairs to their tractors and by refusing to make the same tools with the same level of functionality that dealerships have access to available to the family farmers and the independent mechanics. Without access to the software tools and information needed to fix our equipment, we are forced to rely on dealership technicians for repairs. As a result, farmers report facing lengthy service delays we can ill afford during tight planting and harvest windows and exorbitant repair costs for minor fixes, a major challenge because family farmers typically operate on a razor thin margin. We appreciate Chair Miller's leadership in introducing the Agricultural Equipment Repair Act. Simply put, this bill is about making sure we have the right to fix our own farm equipment or to take our equipment to the repair professional of our choosing. It's about choice and it's about fairness for farmers. I thank you again for holding this hearing and we urge passage of HB 4673 to make sure family farmers have the right to repair. Uh, thank you. Do we have any questions? Yeah. Rep. Kofia, please speak. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for your testimony today. So I wanted to um, pull out a piece of what you just shared uh, in your testimony. You talked about um, examples of exorbitant repair costs for minor fixes. Can you give an example over the years as a, as a dairy farmer where there has been what should have really been a minor fix that ended up costing significant amounts, or perhaps farmers that you know who have encountered that situation? Well, more farmers that I know, uh, because it's been some years since we had uh, dairy on the farm. Um, but uh, yes, uh, just recently, matter of fact, uh, I've got hay on the ground and wanting to bale hay, and I've got a, a new baler. It's a, a 2020 um, version, um, New Holland. And um, it was going to cost um, many thousands, of, or excuse me, many hundreds of dollars to have a technician come and diagnose that baler because it was out of warranty. And it was something that uh, when we got right down to the bottom line, that it was nothing but a, a relatively cheap sensor that uh, could have been replaced had I had some semblance of knowledge of what to look for and uh, how to get at it, kind of. So that would be one instance. Thank you. Are there any more questions? One more. Representative Nyer. Do you think the problem as a whole is as much the pricing as having the access to the information and to be able to diagnose the situation, whether it be through yourself or through the farmer or through the uh, uh, dealership of your choice? Well, the diagnostic part is certainly the uh, the biggest issue. You've got to know what to fix. As the gentleman said earlier, uh, you've got uh, the opportunity to determine what the code might be, but then you don't have the ability to completely clear that code, even if you do fix it. So I'm not sure if that answered your question, uh, Representative. Thank you. Yes, it did. All right. Okay. Do we have any more questions? All right. Moving on. Thank you again for your testimony. Thank you. Moving on. Next, we'll have the North American Dealers Association. Mr. Eric Wargem, please come up. Is my mic on? Yes. <laughs> Good morning, Madam Chairwoman, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Eric Wareham. I am Vice President of Government Affairs for the North American Equipment Dealers Association. Uh, we represent 4,500 farm, industrial, and outdoor power equipment dealers across North America and the U.S. and Canada. 
uh, and we have 92 locations in the state of Michigan. Um, I'm here today to oppose HB 4673, and there's an irony in that because our industry is actually a leading example of one that supports customer self-repair. We've actually formalized that commitment to customer self-repair in a memorandum of understanding with all of the leading major manufacturers. Uh, there is now a MOU in place between John Deere, CNH, Agco, Kubota, and the American Farm Bureau Federation. Those MOUs are private sector solutions that provide access to all of the material, parts, tools, diagnostics, and documentation that's necessary for repair of farm equipment. That agreement has been ratified by each of the 50 state farm bureaus across the country. Uh, with that agreement in place, about 80% of the equipment sold in the United States uh, is covered by an MOU at this point. Um, and I think it's important to talk about what we mean by right to repair. Uh, it can become a catch-all phrase, it can be, it's a slogan, uh, a very good slogan, and, and the reality is that we actually support customer right to repair. And for us, right to repair means access and availability of parts, tools, documentation, and diagnostics. And we believe that our industry already provides that and has committed to that in our MOUs. Uh, you guys have all received from our association a document, uh, looks like this, Repair Done Right. This is a infographic that we have um, that lays out, it's a third-party survey that was conducted of our industry to try to get a, a reality of what the repair landscape looks like in our industry. There's a lot of anecdotal evidence that has been presented, and we appreciate that from the producers that are here today. Uh, for our industry, the reality is that for parts, 56% are sold out the door on average. That means that 56% of parts sold at a farm equipment dealership uh, go out the door and are not installed by the dealership. They're installed by an owner or an independent repair shop. On average, our dealerships sell to nine different independent repair shops. They're really a parts depot. The, the independent repair shop business model is built on piggybacking on the dealership. And the average dealership stocks about a million dollars in parts inventory to keep them on hand so that customers have them when they need them in those short time, those short windows of time uh, when they require them to perform a repair. I'll let our dealers address a little bit more about that and why that's important um, in, in the bill itself. Um, so we clearly support a right to repair for customers. It's probably a, it's a mission statement for most of our dealers to keep customers up and running. So then why do we oppose this legislation if we support right to repair? Because this legislation to us is not about access and availability to parts, tools, documentation, diagnostics. The main thrust of this bill and the operational provision that it has, the mandate that it creates, is fixing the price of parts at dealer net cost and creates a private cause of action to enforce that price fixing. Now, I'm not sure why that's necessary when I've never heard of anyone complaining about availability or access to a part. And you'll hear from our dealers what they do to support customer repair, the cost of carrying that amount of inventory for them, and what would happen if they cannot make a profit from selling parts, how that would significantly disincentivize them from carrying that inventory to serve their customers. I will say that when we're talking about everything we do to support our customers, it can sound like there's no issue here, there's nothing to see. That couldn't be further from the truth. You'll hear from our dealers about the challenges they face in increasing uptime for their customers. What I'm saying is that it's not attributable to access and availability to parts, tools, documentation, or diagnostics. The challenges we have are workforce development. We have a serious shortage of technicians in our industry, and you've heard about wait times, mostly attributable to lack of personnel in the dealership. You'll hear from our dealers what they're doing to increase technicians, but it's a very difficult task. I wish this bill was a workforce bill and not a price-fixing bill. Um, I'll also add and close with this. If you doubt the veracity of anything I'm saying or any of our dealers, I know that the committee is uh, 
trying to line up some field trips for the interim, I would suggest that you visit a dealership. We've held over 50 dealer demonstrations across the country and in Canada to host stakeholders on this issue, primarily Farm Bureau and legislators, but also commodity groups who are concerned about this. Invite you down to the dealership. We'll walk through what the repair offerings are, everything we do. And we always usually ask, is there more that we can do to support you? Because we don't want legislation that's misguided that will have serious unintended consequences. And that in some instances, will invite litigation about the constitutionality of the bill itself. I'll, hold, I'll close there and, and make myself available for any questions. Thank you for your testimony. We will take questions um, now from Representative Diefendorf. Please, you have the floor. Hello. Thank you for offering testimony today. From my understanding, these MOUs are not binding. Is that correct? And given that, why aren't you supportive of codifying a standard to ensure all manufacturers uh, are held to similar standards? It certainly sounds like the members of the Farm Bureau, our independent farmers, um, all really are seeking to see this change. So considering that, wouldn't the best way to serve your clients, your customers, be to give them what they want? Um, so again, are these MOUs binding, and why not just set the standard across the board? So the MOU is binding in the sense that it's a voluntary commitment between the major stakeholders on this issue. There's huge reputational risk for any manufacturer to not live up to that agreement. There's also uh, in place every six months to revisit the MOU and talk about some of the changes. When we talk about the multiple iterations of technology these days moving quickly, you can imagine if we had, if you'd been here 10 years ago and passed legislation, you wouldn't even have been talking about precision agriculture and telematics and the GPS and the autonomous tractors. A private sector solution is so much more suitable to this because it can address that. And we have that built in to a, talk every six months with the American Farm Bureau Federation. In fact, it's coming up in about a month that we're going to reassess the MOUs. So that's one important feature of them. Uh, to breach that type of agreement, I know you said it's not codified. Uh, I think we have a philosophical disagreement about whether we need legislation to codify or force people to take action. I think that that's usually what the market does. Uh, it creates incentives and disincentives. There's a huge disincentive to not living up to the MOU. The reputational risk of any manufacturer, John Deere, Kubota, Agco, or CNH, of breaching the MOU is, is huge. We have a ton of competition in our industry, and a lot of it these days, manufacturers need to make repair offerings available. It's a competitive advantage to do so. When they don't, people are going to look for the options where they can, because downtime is critical and costly. Uh, so I think the, the premise of your question is partially, why don't we just codify what we're doing? One, because it's voluntary. Two, and this is really important, is because there's a substantial difference between what the MOU provides and the legislation. There is no price fixing in the MOU. There is no prize of private cause of action to sue people uh, if they don't sell things at a fair and reasonable cost in the MOU. Um, it's a really more geared towards, the MOU is geared towards actually providing in a detailed way what is necessary to support customer self-repair. Thank you for that. I do think we need to be careful about the terms that we use um, specific to this. I, I, hear, I hear a lot of, <laughs> of declarations about the, the, the negative aspect of this bill or what it entails, and I don't see anything that fits the definition of price fixing. I do know that this, as in other, other areas where we use right to repair, does offer the opportunity to get multiple um, estimates, the lowest possible price among those available estimates. Um, so to me, that does not sound like there is a there's a fixed price, but that we're giving farmers more options. I just want to make sure we stay away from the inflammatory language. Thank you. Yeah, I would not. I wish I wasn't hyperbolic either about that. But the reality is that I'm being blunt. When you look at the definition of fair and reasonable cost and terms on page three, uh, it says that it shall mean any of the following as it relates to a part tool documentation. Subparagraph two, costs that are equivalent to the lowest actual cost for which an equipment, original equipment manufacturer offers a tool 
or documentation to an authorized repair provider. Uh, and then heading down again, subsection A, terms that are equivalent to the most favorable terms under which an original equipment manufacturer offers a part tool or documentation. To us, we've seen that language across the country and there's been over 200 bills on this in the past seven years. To us and everyone else, um, that means dealer net cost. That means that you're taking our dealer supplier and saying you must sell either directly or through an authorized dealer at the lowest cost that you provide to the authorized dealer. Yeah. That's price fixing. And what that does is take our supplier and turn them in also into our competitor because you're forcing them to sell directly instead of through the authorized dealer channel, uh, which is the traditional distribution model. I appreciate that explanation. Representative Smith said something earlier um, about letting the market sort this out, and to me that language is exactly, that's the intent of that language, is to let the market sort that, that sort this out and find the fairest price, and to create the kind of competitiveness that ensures that the customer um, gets the fairest price. Um, that's it for my question. Thank you, Chair. I want to ask you, what commodities have concerns? I'm sorry? What commodities have concerns? You mentioned that. What commodities have concerns? I'm not sure. Can you give me a little more context? So you said that there wasn't any concerns specifically, but if this wasn't an issue, then why are we fix, are looking at fixing it? So um, are they grower groups? I'm sorry, Madam Chairwoman, I, I'm not quite tracking when did I, I, I don't think I ever stated that there were no groups that had concerns about right to repair. All right. Then we'll follow back up with you. Okay, you bet. That. Um, and also, I look forward to working with you on this, as I stated earlier. Thank you. We this appreciate that. This is an ongoing conversation that won't be resolved today, but... It's, it is ongoing. We very much appreciate that. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. So I'm going to move on to Representative Beerline. You have the floor. Thank you. Uh, one of the things that we hear from, uh, you know, our local farmers, sometimes they're worried to maybe do the repair because they're, they have questions about whether that'll void warranty. Can you discuss that at all? Yeah. You know, we have a stable of dealers behind me, and I'd really like to give them time. They can probably address that more adequately than I could. Not, not to dodge your question at all. I would just like to give them the opportunity to discuss that very specifically. All right. Thank you. Representative Reingens. Thank you, Madam Chair. My question, I was looking up some of the MOUs just to read through them, um, and I was trying to figure out where the... Um, like teeth in the um, MOUs are, like what happens if you violate it. Um, in my experience working in like the nonprofit world, um, when we do partnership MOUs, there is some sort of written expectation of what happens if it's violated. And so I was trying to figure out if that was in here somewhere and I, I wasn't quite seeing it the way that it's very clearly written in the bill. Um, Cause as you know, we just write the laws, but there's also enforcement of laws and, and there's not really enforcement of MOUs except by the partners who enter into the MOU. So I was just wondering if you could explain how that, if somebody violates that. Yeah, uh, so I mean, it's again, it's the, the reputational risk that each organization brings to that MOU. There's not a private cause of action to sue if you breach that MOU. Uh, and I don't think that's the intent because the intent of the MOUs is to increase the repair offerings that we have. It's really about increasing uptime for farmers. Um, it's not about creating a private cause of action uh, or enforcement by the Attorney General under a you know um, Consumer Protection Act that's a private contract. So it wouldn't have, by nature, it wouldn't have a, a you know a mechanism of enforcement like a statute would. I guess what I'm saying is if that's not there, then it's a really good idea to put some good words on paper and sign your names, but like it's not really doing anything. Well, I just like it, that would be the same as any other contract you've ever entered into in your life and saying it's only worth what the paper it's written on. I mean, every contract has in its nature, uh, you know, the consideration. In that, some contracts, there is legal ramifications if they're violated, though. This one seems like maybe there's not. So that's just the, what I see as like a difference between like the, the goodwill of 
trying to enter into an MOU onesie twosie at a time and then like making a law for everybody. So that's, I guess it, maybe I'm wrong, but maybe we can follow up afterwards. Yeah, sure. We'll, we'll follow up. Thank you for the question. Thank you. Um, Representative Fitzgerald. Madam Chairwoman, I'd like to save my question for one of the okay. dealers if All possible. Right. Thank you. Representative Stone. Thank you. Um, I'll pose this question to you, and if it's not your wheelhouse, maybe the future testifiers can assess it. So whenever I approach a piece of legislation, I start with what problem is this trying to fix? And from what I heard of the testimony so far, and anyone can feel free to redirect if, if I missed something, uh, what I'm hearing from the farmers is that um, their biggest concern is making sure their equipment is up and running when they need it. And when it, it does go down that they need access uh, to repair as quickly as possible. And the two things that jumped out at me was consolidation of dealers. And so if someone can speak to what does that situation look like, um, which might reduce the amount of competition out there, as well as um, the ease of which of access. And the other piece is um, access to mechanics. So being able to have someone out, you know, same day or in a reasonably quick fashion. Um, I'm just going to tack on there. How is market price determined on the cost of parts? And is it about labor or parts? Um, you know, is it a catalog price? You mentioned that there's a supplier price, or right? So whoever's producing that part, and then they're providing it to a dealer who then has overhead, and then they have a price. Um, so I'm assuming there's some kind of cost if, if a farmer is going directly to a supplier versus going to a dealer in the community. I'll leave it there. Thank you for the questions, Representative Stone. There's a lot there to unpack. I really would like to give our dealers some time to address that, uh, if at all possible. But I will say that our, our industry is highly competitive uh, across brands for parts, uh, highly competitive. And there's also aftermarket parts that don't go through the dealership that are available online. Um, you know, as, as for the other questions, I'll leave them to the dealers, if that's all right. Thank you. Representative Young. Good morning and thank you for your testimony. And so we all know that we're here because there is some issue that needs to be addressed. So we've laid that out and you've already said we support right to repair in some fashion. So two part question. First one, you said earlier that there are 92 uh, dealerships. Is it 92 across the state? Locations. Locations. Yes, ma'am. All right. So of the 92, how many have closed in the last five to seven years? Now that we have 92, how many we used to have? I, I wouldn't know. Wouldn't know I wouldn't know that exactly. But I, our dealers also know their market very well, and I'd let okay. them talk to that right. as well. I mean, because well. you're, you're the person over the yes, organization. I, yes, so I That's why I thought oversee. that might be a question. No, you it's said. a great question. Great okay, question. okay. I'd like to know that. I'd yeah. like to see, because that lends to that consolidation piece. Yeah. And then, as I've been listening, I am not a farmer. I just got a plant for Mother's Day that's barely holding on. <laughs> so just bear with me, everybody. Bear with me. Um, so, but to, but, but to that, we know how important it is to have a qualified workforce. We know, I feel like what I've been hearing over the past uh, couple of months that we've been talking about that, and even on today, that it is a workforce issue. Absolutely. I feel like if the farmers called and somebody showed up, we wouldn't even be here. <laughs> You're right. Maybe I'm wrong. I, no, but, I think you're right. But they're not showing up. So the, that's, that's the key. So I need you to help us understand what you're doing to address this worker shortage that potentially has us here at the table. That's fantastic. And I will leave that to my dealer to okay. talk about. He's going to address that in his comments. I will add one caveat to that, which is <clears throat> the other... I, th I think the other thing that uh, downtime is really attributable to, if, it's, if we're saying it's not for the availability and access to price tools, documentation, diagnostics. Uh, but we believe that it's attributable, one, to work shortage of technicians, so workforce development challenge. But number two is also rural broadband. That's a really important piece here to understand because equipment with technology, when it fails, it has technology built in to, to assess that, to diagnose it. So we have remote diagnostic capabilities. 
A dealership, I know one of the gentlemen said, you know, they have to wait for the dealer to come out to the farm. That's a big challenge. With remote diagnostic capabilities, with the farmer's tech pr permission, a dealership can log into that piece of equipment, remotely diagnose it, and tell them, here's what's wrong, or here's what we ex suspect is wrong, and you can either have us come out, or you can come in and get the part, and you can do it yourself. That technology requires digital infrastructure in the form of rural broadband. And I don't have to harp on you guys. I know this committee is well aware that we don't have ubiquitous rural broadband, especially in rural areas of our states, which is farm country. So it makes it very difficult. So those two issues combined, I think, make up the vast majority of the downtime that farmers are experiencing. Okay. All right. Well, well, thank you for that. I just, you know, I'm just trying to get a simple, the light on my car, because these cars are computers now, right? Yes. It popped up. It said service keyless entry system. I went to the neighborhood auto electrician. I'm like, this sounds like something his wheelhouse. Soon as I walked in, go to the dealer. <laughs> <laughs> went to the dealer. What they tell me? Oh, uh, yeah, we're going to need you to leave it for four to seven days. So I need my car to get to work, but oh my God, I can't imagine something like that happening to people who, you know, we had a lot of talk about essential workers. Farmers are essential. <laughs> no doubt <laughs> about it. We'll be here without them. No so doubt about it. we need them it. to be able to continue to do what they do and to get those repairs and as quickly as possible. And I, you'll, look, you'll hear from our dealers about how much they do to support their customers and keep them up and running. So I appreciate that. Thank you, Representative Young. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Next, we will have Kevin O'Reilly, uh, Public in Interest Resource Group, who will be virtual. Good morning. Thank you for joining us. Good morning. Thank you, Chair Miller and members of the committee. Um, my name is Kevin O'Reilly. I'm the Right to Repair Campaign Director with the Public Interest Research Group, or PERG. We're a uh, nonprofit, nonpartisan public interest advocacy organization, and We've been one of the leaders in the push for right to repair for the better past of the last decade. Um, personally, I've worked with you know more than 100 farmers from all over the country, including in Michigan, uh, to advance this kind of policy. And I've done research looking into the ways that the modern tech you know restricts access to repair, looking into the dealership consolidation issue, um, as well as the costs that this imposes on farmers across the country. So uh, first of all, I just wanted to do a quick kind of run through of the way that farmers and independent mechanics are locked out of fixing modern equipment. Uh, there's really three main steps in which they don't have full access to the same tools and capabilities that dealers have. So first of all, we've heard about diagnosis, right? Um, even with access to what is publicly available under the memoranda of understanding, um, they don't have access to all of the information uh, on what the problem is and how to fix it, right? Troubleshooting kind of falls under that umbrella and is a huge other key, right? They don't have access to the step-by-step -step, uh, actions to take to determine exactly what the problem is. In many cases, they can't get access to things like wiring diagrams and other key information that is needed to go in, figure out the problem, then make the fix. And then Additionally, you know, I'd, I'd argue one of the most important parts of the process in which they can't access what they need is, is to authorize the repair digitally at the end of the process. So you need to be able to uh, install uh, what John Deere, for example, calls payload files, which essentially pair a particular part to your particular uh, tractor or baler or combine. And uh, what that amounts to is simply like essentially like, you know, installing a printer driver. It allows the machine to talk to the part, but um, this is access that only the dealers have currently. And this is something that this right to repair bill would fix and that it would make sure that uh, independent fixers have access to these as well. And so because uh, farmers and independents can't access this kind of these repair materials, right? Farmers have to go back to the dealer. We've heard stories from farmers of cases in which this has happened. Uh, this is reducing competition, it's reducing farmer repair choice, and it leads to inflated repair costs and long delays. So, um, <clears throat> you know, in some cases, these delays can be days, sometimes weeks. I've heard of months uh, from farmers across the country as well. And uh, my research actually found that uh, these repair restrictions are costing uh, Michigan farmers, 
you know, $124 million per year, $89 million per year in the downtime that they're facing and the loss of crop or the decreased value of their crop. And then another $35 million in uh, repair costs uh, because they have to pay the higher rates that the dealers charge. Now, of course, you know, that's not assuming that all of a sudden if every farmer is going to fix every problem with their equipment. There are still going to be cases like we talked heard about earlier about a full transmission overhaul. Those are things where farmers are still going to go uh, back to the dealer, but they need to have the option to do so. Um, the other thing I would say, right, is we talked a little bit about dealership consolidation. This is something we've seen across the board, uh, but uh, John Deere, from my research, is by far the most consolidated. Um, right now, there's one John Deere dealership chain for every 15 thousand and five hundred Michigan farms and every 3.3 million acres of Michigan farmland. So I think that's one of the reasons that we're seeing these workforce problems. And, you know, given the fact that there, there aren't enough technicians to do the work, I think it's really important that we make sure that independent fixers, whether that's the farmer themselves or another mechanic, have the ability to do this work. Um, one other thing I quickly wanted to touch on that uh, we've talked a bit about are the, the MOUs or the Memoranda of Understanding and some of the problems that we have, right? We've talked about the lack of enforcement, that's a major problem. Farmers need to have a uh, course, of, you know, recourse uh, to be able to take in order if they are denied access to things. Um, there are some loopholes that don't require comprehensive access to the repair tools that the dealer has. Um, I've actually seen that firsthand in, in comparing what's publicly available versus what the dealer uh, dealers are able to use. And then also manufacturers can walk a day, walk away with just 30 days notice. So, uh, you know, it's really important that we in, install this into law to make sure that farmers do have this option, do have repair options for uh, the foreseeable future. Um, and so, yeah, I think that this is a really strong bill. This is a very important bill. This is one that we're seeing momentum around across the country, but uh, it's, it's an important way to protect Michigan farmers, protect their crop and um, give them back just the agency of ownership. Let them be able to fix their own stuff, right? They're spending sometimes hundreds of thousands of dollars on it. They should be able to fix it. So thank you very much for your consideration. I'd be happy to answer any questions. None? Thank you so much. We appreciate hearing from you today. Next, we have Mr. Scott Wadsworth with Tri-County Equipment Dealer. Can you please come up? Good morning. Good morning. It's on? Okay. Um, thanks for having me today. Um, my name is Scott Wadsworth. I'm with Tri-County Equipment. We are an 11 location John Deere dealer that's owned by my family. We're in Eastern Michigan, so we cover the Thumb area, Saginaw Valley, Northern Detroit, that's where we're located at. Um, I have a prepared statement I'll just like to read to you guys. Um, I stand before you today to address the critical issues that affect not only the agriculture community, but also the safety and well-being of farmers and consumers. The topic at hand is proposed right to repair legislation, specifically regarding farm equipment. While the right to repair movement has its merits, it must be carefully considered the unique challenges, implications, and prints for the industry. Firstly, I want to emphasize that the bill in question is unnecessary. Farmers and equipment and independent repair shops already have access to an array of resources required for diagnostic and repairing equipment. Sorry, I was nervous. <laughs> Operators and technical manuals, operational and technical manuals, diagnostic routines, parts, tools, and schematics, and electronic service capabilities are already available. We don't need legislation to, man to mandate what is already accessible. Safety is paramount in our industry. Um, farm equipment with its complex machinery and advanced technology requires specialized knowledge and training for proper repair and maintenance. Allowing unrestricted access to equipment, software, and code raises significant safety hazards. Improper modifications in untrained individuals could result in injuries or even fatalities for farm workers or consumers. It is crucial to recognize that manufacturers invest substantial resources to ensure their equipment is prepared safely and effectively. Open access to code undermines these safety measures and places employees customers and businesses at risk. Another important consideration is the integrity of the equipment that is in compliance with environmental regulations. Unauthorized modifications such as increased engine horsepower or disabling emission systems not only compromise equipment performance, but also contribute to premature wear and negative environmental impacts. Identifying such tampering becomes a challenge, making it difficult to guarantee the safety, compliance, and environmental sustainability of the equipment. 
Let me be clear, supporting customers' ability to repair their equipment is important. We acknowledge the need to access to necessary parts, tools, and resources. However, we must draw a line when it comes down to unauthorized and unsafe modifications that compromise the safety, liability, emissions, compliance, and code access. In conclusion, while the right to repair movement holds its merits, we must carefully consider the new challenges proposed to farm equipment. The proposed bill is unnecessary and fails to account for safety risk, competitive impacts, environmental concerns, and equipment integrity. That's all I have. Thank you. Any questions for the dealer? Yes, Emily, please. I think you did a great job. Thanks. Um, so I, I just had a, a couple of questions just to clarify what we're looking at here today. At this time, if a farmer wanted to go to somebody to have their equipment repaired or have somebody come out to the farm um, and they were not qualified and they did terrible work, it's, it's an option. It's already an option, right? Yes, we can you. always find it, somebody who's unqualified to do work, right? Yes. Okay. Um, and this legislation isn't advocating or fighting for open access to code uh, as, as well as you understand it, correct? It's not, it's not asking that just anybody has open access to code. Would you agree that it's, it's asking that more folks who are professionals in repairing farm equipment have access to the codes or be able to open up the equipment so they can repair the equipment? It's not just, we're not saying we should take it to the guy down the street. From my understanding, the way it's written is the code access would be more open, which creates a problem for that modification. So we have in our industry a lot of, they call it chipping. So people making engine modifications are adding more horsepower, which uses more fuel. So that is actually changing code, which defeats engine emissions um, compliance issues and everything. And that's that premature wear. So if these engines are only made to run 500 horsepower, but you're gonna put a chip in and it's gonna run 560, 550 horsepower, so you got all this necessary wear, you're running more fuel through, you're creating more um, smoke emissions, it's gonna go through the system. So that, so on our dealer side, we don't actually have access to the, the base code of the software. We get those payloads like the other testifier talked about, and those are just pretty much software updates we install. But as far as going in and changing code that affects safety systems or any of that stuff, we don't, as a dealer, we don't have access to that tool either. If, if we clarified that this legislation is not seeking to allow anybody open access to code, would you be more comfortable with it? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Next, uh, Representative Vanderwall. Thank you, Madam Chair, and appreciate you being here and taking some time to explain the bill. A uh, little piggyback on the, the good reps uh, question over there. When it comes to the um, technology, I think we all know that it's very important that things aren't altered, things aren't abused so that we, number one, it can do damage to the machine. How, how do we make sure that the, uh, the currently, a farmer that comes in and buys a piece of equipment from you is uh, given the access or the opportunity to buy the diagnostics or made aware of that? So right now, everything is offered either through the dealership or online through the uh, John Deere's website. They call it Customer Service Advisor. That is a program that's similar to the diagnostic program that we at the dealership have. Um, they can check all their trouble codes. It has their tech manuals on it. There's some interactive tests on there too. So if there's a sensor or something, it'll run you through the testing of that sensor to tell you that, yep, you need to look at the sensor that's on the end of this wiring harness. So that all that is available to them. The tools, I cannot speak for certain, are online yet, but I know we can order them from the dealership and sell them to the customer. Okay, so are, if a customer comes in and purchases a tractor, you, are you informing them that there's the opportunity that they could purchase this equipment on their own, or is that something they've got to seek out on their own? So we are, it's also on our website. I can't speak for the other dealer organizations, but I know we have made our customers aware in the last, I'm gonna say three years, the ones who have this technology enabled equipment that these are available to them. All right, very good, thank you. Thank you. Next, Representative Beerline. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. I just re-ask my question about warranty, and if you know, if I perform the work on my own piece of equipment, is it still under warranty, or because I'm not certified in any way? <laughs> so most all warranties to manufacturer cover de defects in workmanship or materials. So if there's something physically wrong with how either the unit was assembled, or if there's a bad part on it from the factory. What the misconception in the industry is right now in the public is, we're not saying that if you change your battery or change your spark plug, your warranty is voided. That's not what this is. That's, that's not how that works. You can do your own oil changes. You can do your own maintenance. You can do any of that stuff. What it comes down to is that access to the code and the safety overrides and the concerns that would arise from that. But as far as your actual warranty, there's, I have to talk to manufacturer, but there's very little you can actually do that's going to void your warranty unless it's a major physical modification to that machine. Representative Stone. Thank you. Um, I want to circle back. First of all, thank you for your testimony. I want to circle back to some of the questions that I still had um, about the issues at large. Um, one is about consolidation. I don't know that you can speak to beyond your um, business, but the industry at large, what does consolidation look like? And perhaps what are some of the reasons? Um, the second part about that is around is what is the turnaround time for mechanics you provide between a request for service and being able to get them out into the field and get that managed? Okay. So on the consolidation side, I, I'll just speak for our business. So we're located in the Thumb, Eastern Michigan. Our family also farms. We've been serving our neighboring farmers and communities since 1985. So in that time, we've added more locations from other dealers who want to retire or just got to exit the industry altogether. So we service um, from Caseville to I-75 in Saginaw to northern Detroit. And a lot of those customers are all the same farmer relations. They all know each other. They're all on boards and committees together and all that stuff. So that's kind of been a natural growth, and we kind of service and take care of that community there. I know other areas and other parts of the world, too. There's, there's bigger organizations growing and coming together. And most of that comes down to, even our case, a lot of these tools and training and stuff, there is quite an expense to all this stuff. So to have, I don't know, four or five different in companies servicing one area when someone needs to buy a, I'm just going to example, $10,000 tool, it's a hard stretch if you're going to have that, have that one tool for one tractor you might have sold. But if you have sold five of those tractors and you can kind of spread it out between this company, you could use this tool multiple times. Is what going on. But in a lot, a lot of that too, the farmers got bigger too. So there's not the there's still a lot of small farms and a lot of medium-sized farms, but the larger farms all got bigger. Um, the technician shortage really affects all of us, so that's another problem. So to have, I'm saying, if you had one store and you had six techs, you might not be able to keep them busy. But if you had ten stores and fifty techs, you might be able to spread it out a little more. <coughs> our average coverage time, the way we're set up for location-wise, our customers, we're within an hour. I mean, it's mostly faster than that, but every store is within an hour of someone. I'm assuming there's some busy seasons, and um, at, at the peak of your busy season, uh, is there a lot more demand on those techs? Yes. Yep. So, um, I mean, most of them all, I don't know how they hold their family lives, but they're working from like 6 a.m. to 9, 10 o'clock at night covering all these different techs. Because we're servicing from uh, regular row crop farmers who are growing our corn or food crops, produce. And we have the large dairies too, and they're working all hours of the night. So they got cattle they're feeding at night, stalls are cleaning out all that industry there. So I mean, our schedules for our tax are quite hectic for them. Please, one more follow up. I'm I'm starting to see a trend around workforce tax. Um, do you have any insights as to why there's a shortage in mechanics and tax? Personally, I think we've started in the last I'm gonna say 10 years to steer kids more towards those non-skilled trades jobs. So there's not a lot of kids going to school for engine work. And then I don't know if it's just the way the world is now, but there's not a lot of kids want to get their hands dirty. They don't want to be grease monkeys. They don't want to do the wrenching. They want to do the computers, the robotics, and that stuff, which there is a part to that, but we still need people who are going to do the, the dirty jobs. They're going to get in there. They're going to do the engine rebuilds. They're going to work on the mechanical issues that we have. Access to uh, schooling is this expensive. Okay, I'll let someone else go. <laughs> All right. We're gonna wrap up one more question. Uh, Rep 
Representative Fitzgerald. My, my question pertains to, as you're operating a dealership and you have a, you know, a million dollars of parts behind the counter, you've also got somebody there to help your customer identify what part, pick the part, bring it out, make sure it's exactly what's needed. Um, in terms of the operation of, the, of a dealership and the, and the parts that you're providing, I too see in, in this, um, this bill the question about the cost of that part and the question about the overhead that you have to ensure those those pieces of equipment that you have on site to pay for the person there at the counter to to make sure i mean don't get me wrong i support the farmers being able to repair those items um, self-sufficiency is, is a marker of, of the agricultural community as a whole um, but understanding though that as an integral part of this the dealerships have um, a lot of overhead and a lot of responsibility to make sure that they're knowledgeable, that they are trained, that they are um, getting that, uh, uh, rather than decrease downtime, I'll use it as increase uptime, because I've heard it both ways, but increase uptime. So my question to you is, how do you believe this bill can be improved to still support the farmers and the opportunity to repair and utilize your services, but not necessarily take away the opportunity to have that network of, of professionals and knowledgeable professionals within your organizations? Do you, are there suggestions that, that can be made? It would mostly come down that parts pricing language needs to be a little more clarified of what that is actually intended to be met there. Um, ourselves, we have 43 people working in our parts department at the counter, so they're actually the ones selling the parts, looking up the parts, giving the, the customers. Um, we have over $12 million in inventory and parts to take care of people, but that the way the language, I don't want to say it's vague, but the way it is understood by us is that it would take away that um, incentive to have those people to have those parts on staff. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much you. for answering all these questions, challenging <laughs> questions. You did very well, by the way. <laughs> Next up is Willie Cade with Repair.org. He will be virtual. Thank you, Chair Miller. My name is Willie Cade. I'm board member of Repair.org, and I specialize in the issue of agricultural right to repair. Um, I'd like to address in my testimony uh, three specific, what I consider myths uh, about right to repair in agriculture. The first one is around the software that's available to independent service organizations and to um, farmers or owners of the equipment. Um, the software that is made available today currently is a uh, reduced capable piece of software as compared to what the dealers can do. Uh, specifically in uh, the MOUs that have been signed, section uh, two, part B, Paragraph six says that the specialized tools, i.e. the software, will, in a, will be provided, and in the case of John Deere, as of January 8th this year, uh, for to download what Kevin referred to earlier as the payload files or embedded files. This capability is currently not available, and it is an example of where a voluntary um, uh, effort has fallen short, where they list it as something that they will do, but it is not being done. Uh, number two, they talked about uh, earlier about uh, emissions and that uh, making the software available would somehow uh, be illegal because it would allow farmers to circumvent the emissions. Emission systems are part of our national laws under the Clean Air Act. And as a matter of fact, the Clean Air Act requires manufacturers to make any and all tools and information available to owners of the equipment on the same quality level and the same capability level as provided to dealers. 
That's currently not being done. And it is clearly a violation of the existing law. And then uh, third, um, often talks about, there's often talking about um, that this law, right to repair law, would violate intellectual property. Uh, repair is not a violation of intellectual property law, either in the patent world or in the copyright world. That has been uh, successfully adjudicated by the Librarian of Congress since 2015 for three consecutive triannual um, events. Um, I also want to kind of point out to uh, here that there is, and we all concur, even I believe the dealers and Mr. Weirheim concur, that there is a shortage of technicians. If we were able to pass this legislation, it would be helpful to be able to provide and have individual farmers learn how to fix, fix their own equipment. And we could even use some of the technicians that work on uh, over the road highway trucks, which use much of the same technology as agricultural equipment during peak periods when those kinds of technicians are needed most. So there's a way we can cross train, if you will. Um, and I think it's important to understand that according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, that agricultural diesel technicians of the three categories of agriculture, um, highway truck and government uh, uh, employed diesel technicians, agricultural technicians are paid the lowest. This is a free market system. If the dealer wants more technicians, they may need to go out into the market and pay more for those technicians. I'll end my testimony here uh, for any questions. Representative Young. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Okay, so I want to pick up right where you left off. You said if they need more technicians, they need to pay them. Is that what, is, is that what you said, to pay more, to get more? I want to be clear. I heard what you said. Yes, yes ma'am. Uh, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, agricultural diesel technicians, which are the kind of technicians that we're talking about, um, are the lowest paid of the three categories. Hmm. So you're saying that it's not necessarily that we don't have the people who can do the work. It's just that they're not being paid adequately in some, in some cases. I, I, in some cases, that's true, but it's also true that Given the peak need, i.e. during planting and harvesting, mm -hmm. we could have cross-trained individuals who have the skill sets to work with di diesel equipment to come over from the highway truck and work on, uh, work on agricultural equipment. Now, mind you, that would require the full availability of software that's available to dealers. Quite frankly, I think it's a, a reasonable solution for dealers, too, because then they wouldn't have to pay or carry that employee for the full year. So I think there's some real opportunities here if we open up the access to all of the uh, service advisor, parts advisor, all of the software that is used to repair this equipment and not have it be a limited set that is constrained, uh, that's now provided, that's called customer service provider. Okay, thank you for that real quick. So uh, in your work, because you're trying, you sound like some type of expert. Um, quick question for you. Have you all been utilizing or is there any work being done around training returning citizens? Um, I have a personal long history in returning citizens. And quite frankly, uh, the kinesthetic skill set of returning citizens is very good. I've trained them for years on, on refurbishing computers. 
but I won't go into that detail in this here, but I would be happy to talk to you in great detail about it, Representative. Thank you. All right. We're going to have to move on. Thank you again for your testimony. We appreciate hearing from you today. Um, Thank you, because, Chair Miller. Oh, absolutely. I would like to read in a letter from Mr. Mark Metz. He's a farmer in Ida. He was supposed to be here today to present and testify, but unfortunately, he fell ill. He wanted me to read this, um, reading it verbatim. Legislation to allow farmers to access diagnostic software documents and repair manuals for electronic aspects of our equipment is just an, as important as any other component of the same machine. Often, I'm able to see a warning light or an error message only to be required to call dealer support, a costly and time-consuming process. This very spring, I had an error, which turned out to be a simple cord um, working, that w the, and it was unplugged, unfortunately. After paying for a service tech to drive to my farm an hour and a half each way, I got an initial bill for $790 for a five-minute job of plugging in a wire. The dealership ultimately took 50% off the bill, um, which was reduced to $395 is still a very hefty price for a simple bit of work. Often drivers of trucks, cars, see a service light appear on their dash and can stop into a, a myriad of local repair shops or parts dealers and have their problem diagnosed for free. Whether or not they repair the item themselves, they at least have a free or low-cost di diagnosis of their vehicle's issue. Farmers are asking for the same consideration. Farmer equipment manufacturers have suppressed release of simple diagnostic software and the manuals that are commonly available to in other sectors of the economy. Why? Because they can and it's profitable for them to do so. They have a niche on the market that they easily are able to exploit because of competition within manufacture and particularly between dealers and local repair de shops is nearly gone. Prospects of ending hours to days of waiting and hundreds to even thousands of dollars of repair bills is, to say the least, helpful and a game changer for me as a farmer. I hope that the legislation is able to advance this work that will greatly benefit myself and thousands of other family farmers who rely on these technologies every day on their farms. I will now read into the record cards that have been submitted. So I have Andrew Vermish, Michigan Farm Bureau, takes no position on the bill. Rachel McGowan McCarthy, Motorcycle Industry Council, is neutral on this bill. Kelly Turner, Potato Growers of Michigan, supports this bill. Dave, it looks like Worthians, Michigan Manufacturers Association, is in, um, opposes this bill. Jacob Feist, Michigan um, Corn Grower, supports the concept of right to repair. We've heard from him. Tom Leonard, State Innovation Exchange, is in support of the bill. Nicholas Acapinti, Michigan Conservation Voters, is in support of the bill. Eric Warham, we've heard from, uh, and he opposes the bill. Josh Wagner, Hudson Incorporated, is opposed to the bill. Jeff Oldman, Greenmark Equipment, opposes the bill. William Miller, Operating Engineers, Local 324, opposes the bill. Craig Vander Coke opposes the bill. Scott Wadsworth opposes the bill. Mitch Albers, Department of Attorney General, is in support of the bill. Director Tim Boring, MDARD, supports the bill. Thank you, everyone, for your testimony today. Representative Stone excuses board members who are absent, and there is no further um, business with this committee today. We stand adjourned. Thank you, everyone.